Eagles are
everything under control and uh, get this thing started. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Charlie Hales. I'm your mayor. I'm here with the rest of our city council who will be making an appearance one by one as they make their way in, but Commissioner Amanda Fritz is here. We expect our colleagues to join us, but because we have a lot of people here and a lot of people who want to speak, we'll get started quickly. Uh, I don't have a long introduction, but I do have a question. Uh, for how many of you is this your first budget meeting? Hold up your hand. Wow, okay, and I know our, our facilitators have some other questions, but I think this is one that's not on their list. How many of you are students? How many of you are students? All right, let's hear it for the students. We like having students at our meeting. So I just gotta say, I, I love looking out and seeing this big group here tonight, you know, at a time where uh, maybe there's reason to question whether democracy still works at some levels of government. It's nice to see that it's alive and well in East Portland. So congratulations for being active citizens and thank you all for coming tonight. Our job tonight is to listen to you. Um, we are in the process of drafting our city budget. My job is to propose the budget and then the council deliberates and hears more from the community and decides on the budget. I'll be doing, I'll be preparing that mayor's proposed budget over the next few weeks uh, in releasing it late this month. So you're here at the right time to tell us about what's important to you, what do you think we should do more of, less of, stop doing, for, for goodness sakes, keep doing. All those things are very important, especially for those of you who haven't been to a city council meeting. I think what you need to know is that you have clout. People show up at these meetings, whether it's our regular meetings during the day in City Hall or a community forum like this, and they make their case and the city council hears you and we change our mind about things. So again, one thing I want to assure you as somebody who gets to the privilege of hearing from Portlanders is you'll see your city council take in the information that you provide, think about it and make decisions based on what you tell us. So we appreciate the chance to listen. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to our facilitators unless you, Commissioner Fritz, have anything you wanna add at the outset? I just wanted to say thank you so much, everybody, for being here. It does make a difference, and this is what democracy really is all about. Thank you so much. So I'm going to turn it over to our facilitators. They're going to get this started and have our budget director give you some basic information about our budget, and we'll take it from there. All right. Thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Teresa Logan. This is Anthony Jackson. We're from Resolutions Northwest, a local Portland community nonprofit dispute resolution center. We do mediation, facilitation, training on all kinds of different things. Look us up sometime if you're interested. But we're gonna move fast through this intro so we can get to the testimony because that's why we're all here tonight. So Teresa's a good fast talker. I'm not as good of a fast talker, so I'm gonna actually try to talk faster than I normally talk tonight. So who's here from, oh, I don't know, the east side? <laughs> all right, all right, good to see. So who's here from the west side? Couple hands in the back yeah, there. Got a few don't back be shy. There. All right, what about folks from the north, from North Portland? Who's here from there? Okay. Couple hands over here also. All right. Representative, how about outside of Portland? Couple hands as well. All Welcome. Right. Thank you, welcome. All right, so who here, uh, elected officials? We know who's here. Is anybody else in the audience? Elected officials? All right. Uh, what about city staff? City staff, all right, and media, media folks. David's Got a couple there. hands in the back. Okay, all right. So um, who's here to express a concern about something in the proposed budget? All right. It's about half the hands in the room. And who actually hopes to give testimony? Who wants their voice to be heard? All right, thank you. All right, so quickly how we're gonna get to your testimony here tonight. We're gonna hear a brief presentation from Budget Director Andrew Scott. We're gonna have a couple slots reserved for testimony specifically about utilities. We have one person signed up. If anyone else would like to give testimony specific to utilities, please go sign up at the registration desk. Um, after that, we're gonna move on to um, the testimony on the general budget. And we're gonna 
open a couple spots open for anyone who has child care, elder care responsibilities and youth, and then we'll move on to the random drawing. So it might be a little bit confusing, but we're gonna walk around with a box. That those of you who have a ticket in your hand that has a number on it, the same number is in the box at the registration table. We're gonna walk around and we're gonna ask you and the public to help us draw those numbers. That's gonna be the, how we randomly decide who gets to speak tonight because we most likely will not have time to make it through everyone who wants to give testimony. So if you see me come by with a box, draw a number or two out of there for me to help us make sure that it's a fair process that everyone has an equal chance of participating tonight. Right, so we're also gonna have invited testimony from three panels of three community representatives organized by Portland's Community Engagement Liaisons. So these are voices that are not often heard. Uh, invited testimony to hear perspectives of the, the new Portlander youth leaders, the Russian-speaking Portlanders, and the Oregon Bhutanese Community Organization. Those are the three groups that are gonna be invited to give testimony tonight. And if you don't get a chance to come up and give your testimony tonight, you can submit your testimony in writing by email. You can get comment cards at the registration table out front. You can submit them then. Whether If you just prefer not to give oral testimony, you can also submit your comments in writing. Um, we're not gonna have a break. We're gonna get through as many people as we can. Restrooms, there is one directly out this back door behind the exit that is gender neutral. If you go to the my right, that way. <laughs> that way, are men's restrooms, and if you go this way to my left, there are women's restrooms. Um, and with that, we will turn it over to the budget director, Andrew Scott. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna do a very quick presentation, because as they mentioned, um, we're really here to listen to you tonight, you're not here to listen to me, but I do wanna give a little bit of context um, about the city budget and, and, and what we're looking at in terms of this, this next year coming up, and so I've got the slideshow um, behind me. Um, I tend to talk really fast, so um, I'm gonna sort of balance that, like slow down so you can hear me, but fast so I can get through it and you can get to your testimony. Um, I'm also gonna be around um, for the rest of the evening as well as um, staff from the city budget office. If you have specific questions, um, we'll be happy to try and answer those where we can take your name uh, and get back to you with that answer in the future. So again, a brief walk through the overall city budget. Um, there are four priorities uh, as we go into the um, fiscal year 16-17 budget. Um, housing and homelessness, public safety, um, core services and preservation of city assets uh, were the priorities that the mayor put out in terms of his budget guidance for next year. The overall city budget um, is, is $4.1 billion. Um, this is obviously a very large amount. What this pie chart does is it tries to break that down, though, into some pieces that may make a little bit more sense. Um, within that overall $4.1 billion, $2 billion of that are program expenditures. I think this is what most people think about when they think about a budget. Um, these are the dollars that go for environmental services and transportation and public safety and the programs that I think most of you are here to testify about. In addition to that, um, we also have some other things. We have um, reserves, which make up about 25% of that, So, and these reserves exist for a, a wide variety of reasons uh, in all of our different funds, but we do have reserves. We have transfers between funds. Um, these are really, uh, to be totally frank, they're just double counts as money goes back and forth between different funds in the budget, but by Oregon state law, we're required to report them, so they're included there as well. And then finally, debt repayment makes up about 12% of that $4.1 billion total. In terms of the overall budget process, um, the city's fiscal year starts July 1st, runs through June 30th. Right now, uh, as the mayor mentioned, he's putting together his proposed budget for the fiscal year 2016-17 budget. So it's this, it's this coming, uh, coming July 1st starts. Um, we make adjustments a couple of times throughout the year uh, as well, and we must have an adopted budget by June 30th. That's the process that we're going through to design this budget. Um, in terms of how resources are allocated, um, when the city puts together its budget, and I get a lot of questions from citizens about this, we do have to pay close attention to where our resources come from. Um, for instance, some funds are dedicated to specific uses and can only be used for those particular programs. When you pay your water and sewer bill and the city runs the water and sewer system, we're restricted uh, to spend those dollars on our water and sewer um, utility system. Um, building permit fees, if you're doing a remodel or if you own a business and you come in uh, and pay your building permit fees, they have to be used to pay for the permit and uh, system for the development services system. Um, gas taxes that you pay or parking revenue has to pay for the transportation system. On the other hand, the general fund, 
um, can be used for really anything that's within the city's charter, and that charter is very broad, and, and, and I'll talk a little bit more detail about the general fund. But those revenues mainly come from property taxes, from business license taxes that are paid from, from, from businesses in the city, and utility license taxes paid by utilities in the city. And the general fund is allocated based on council priorities. And it's events like this one tonight where they get to hear from you about what your priorities are as they construct next year's budget. Um, in terms of that overall general fund um, discretionary, uh, um, in terms of the overall general fund, it, it's about $487 million. So again, it's a small, smaller subset of the $4.1 billion, but still obviously a very large amount. Um, and this pie chart, which I won't go into detail, but it does break down the base funding for all of our general fund bureaus um, next year. And one of the things I do want to note is there's an orange slice um, up towards the top left, and you probably can't read that, um, but it says surplus funds of about $20 million. Um, th that's what we're expecting, what we're projecting for next year is a surplus of about $20 million. And that surplus, about 4.4 million of it, is what we consider ongoing funds. So these are our revenues we expect to get next year and expect to get in future years as well. About 15.9 million of that is what we consider one-time funds. These are funds we expect to receive in 1617, but we don't necessarily expect to receive them the year after. The reason that's important is we don't want to use one-time funds to pay for an ongoing program because it means we'll be back here next year with potential cuts. So with that 4.4 million, we want to invest that in programs we expect to continue. The 15.9 million we want to expect we want to invest in one-time programs like infrastructure. So this is fixing fixing our parks, fixing our our, our facilities. Uh, again, those one-time dollar expenditures. Um, in terms of, of that overall context for 1617, um, the mayor issued, and every year he issues, budget guidance to bureaus as they prepare their budgets. And you may have read about this in the paper, um, or, or this may be the first time. But going into 1617, the mayor asked bureaus, uh, he outlined his priorities, and he asked for a few things. He asked general fund bureaus to propose 5% cuts um, for next year. He also asked them to look for areas where they can realign their resources to focus on their core missions and council priorities, notably focusing on the housing and homelessness crisis in Portland. And he also asked bureaus to only request ad packages for council priorities, for infrastructure spending, or to increase equity in terms of how we deliver city services. And finally, non-general from bureaus were asked to look for efficiencies before asking for rate increases. One of the questions I do get a lot uh, from both the media and from citizens is, well, if you had that $20 million surplus, which was on the pie chart, why are we talking about cuts going into this next year's budget? And the reason for that is, as I mentioned, of that $20 million, only about $4.5 million of that is what we consider ongoing. When we, uh, in working with the mayor and working with council, when we looked at next year's budget, um, we knew that there were significant costs around the housing and homelessness crisis. We knew there were significant costs in police and fire. And we knew there were significant costs in parks that were going to need to be funded, that council and the citizens were going to want to be funded. And so as a result of that, the mayor said, I need to see some cuts from bureaus so that we can look at potential realignments in terms of how the city spends dollars in order to fund those other priorities. What we have on the next um, four slides, I'm actually not going to go into in the interest of time, but we try and break out what some of the major requests that came in from bureaus in terms of the 1617 budget. And we broke those out by housing and homelessness, public safety, parks and recreation, preservation of city assets, which again is that infrastructure, and finally equity and inclusion. And then one of the last slides, um, again, talks a little bit more about significant reductions. And we sort of list those by public safety, parks and recreation, community development, and support services. This slideshow is on our website. Um, so if you feel uh, you want to go look at it in a little bit more detail, that's at portlandoregon.gov backslash CBO, which stands for City Budget Office. And again, I have this, and I'm happy to walk through. And I think there's a little bit of this information in the uh, handout as well. Uh, I'm happy to go through those in more detail. And then finally, the very last slide, opportunities to provide um, testimony. Uh, we're in the second box there, April 12th. This is one of our budget forums. Um, in addition to this, uh, council will be taking testimony at May 12th, uh, which will be a budget committee public hearing. Also May 18th, when they approve the budget. Um, there's a specific utility rate review hearing on May 19th. Um, a local group called the Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission, which has been in existence for 100 years. Um, they take te public testimony on our budget as well. No one ever shows up. So uh, if you feel like you want to give testimony, uh, that's a good time to do it. Uh, and finally, when council adopts the budget on June 9th, we'll be taking testimony then as well. As I mentioned, I'll be here to answer questions. At this point, I'll turn it back over to the facilitators, and we'll get started with testimony. Thanks. 
All right, thank you very much. So if people have additional questions, there's the uh, city budget office staff. And where's the city budget office staff? Hands, in the hands? back at the registration the table where you came okay, in. Okay, all right. So just head on back there. They can help you. And there's also uh, the city budget office at portlandoregon.gov uh, that you can contact. All right. So as I mentioned, we're ready to move on to testimony. We do have two, well, kind of three kinds of testimony here tonight. The first one we're going to start off with is utility testimony. All testimony will have two minutes. So if you signed up and have the one blue number in the room for utility testimony, please come to the front. And as he's coming down here, um, we are going to move on to, is there anyone in the room who has child care commitments or elder care commitments? So raise your hands high. We can take three. So I see one, two, and three. If you'll come down and be on deck, um, as we're calling numbers and inviting people to testify tonight, you can come up here to the microphone for utility testimony. We're going to ask you to come into this front row of seats up here. Uh, and ask you to sit here so you're on deck and can mo uh, move immediately up to the microphone when it's your turn. So we'll have utility testimony followed by these folks. Go ahead and start when you're ready. Good evening. My name is Sam Pastrick and I'm here as a representative of the Citizens Utility Board of Oregon. We represent residential utility customers in the state and as of 2014 we also represent Portland Public Utilities customers, ratepayers in the city of Portland. I have two quick issues that I want to briefly touch on. The first is in regard to fees that BES is allowed to charge developers for building permitting and environmental st standard compliance with that permitting. Uh, basically, CUB would like to see the city council address what we see as being a, a pretty sizable cost recovery gap. An example of this is during fiscal year 2014-15, the last year for which complete data are available, BES recovered 47% of these fees from developers. The remaining portion, of course, was paid for by ratepayers themselves. Um, this in our mind, in our opinion, is really an unfair and unreasonable and unnecessary subsidy directly to developers. The point that I hope to make is that 47% is really far too low. Um, had BES, for instance, recovered 90% during the same fiscal year, the Bureau would have increased revenue by, roughly speaking, $1.3 million. That's $1.3 million in the pockets of ratepayers. The second issue that I quickly want to touch on is uh, that CUB supports additional resources for the Water Bureau around uh, more rigorous outreach efforts uh, in regard to the monthly billing option. Uh, really, CUB strongly supports the monthly billing option, and with these outreach efforts of particular interest to us are um, seeing these efforts targeted toward historically underrepresented and underserved communities. And that's really all I have tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you. A couple things we forgot to mention. Um, if you would, if you hold off applause, it helps us move faster. And if you actually, some people hate this, some people love it. If you actually do jazz hands, if there's something you want to support, it provides a much better visual for those of us in the front, especially the mayor and the commissioners, to see how many people support an idea than applause does. So it helps us move faster. It actually expresses your point better, even if you hate it. Um, so everyone who comes up tonight will have two minutes. I forgot to mention Vishnu, one of our volunteers, is sitting over here. He's got some signs. So if you are testifying, and you'll keep an eye out for him. He'll let you know when you're at the one minute mark, when you have one minute remaining, when you have 30 seconds remaining, and when your time is up. And so we're gonna invite the three of you to come on up to the mics, and we're gonna ask now, are there any youth in the room who wanna testify who might need to get home to do homework and get to bed? So any youth? So raise your hands high if you are youth and would like to provide testimony. Here's one, we'd ask you to come to the front. Any other youth in the room who'd like to provide testimony? Two, is there anyone else? I see another hand in the back here. Come on up to the front, please. Okay, I'm a major. Okay. What happened here? Good evening. You had to try this? Do you want to try places? I'll be fine. Okay. We're different issues. Is that okay? I do. I do. Yeah. yeah. I have to get home more. There was, but then she walked out. There's this woman over here. I thought we were going to come up one at a time. Okay, go ahead. 
Okay, are we ready? Okay, thanks for listening to me. I drove all the way down from St. John's because my community center preschool program is so, so important to me. Just give it um, my, can you hear me okay? Yeah, just give us your name. Lindsay. Um, whew. Uh, I feel like in the last five years, I've heard a lot about the struggling middle class, and um, I think that this budget issue and the preschool, it, it kind of, it, it really is, illustrates a point for me. Um, my family barely fell short of qualifying for WIC when I was pregnant, um, and likewise barely could get into a Head Start program. Um, we're considered middle class, but we're struggling and we're working and we're doing all we can. But so I was overjoyed when I discovered the preschool program at Charles Jordan and I have watched my son thrive. He is so, he's doing so good with his letters and numbers. And I just, um, he's going to be four next year and I really want him to continue his education. Um, I'm a very active parent in his education, but what he's gotten from this program has been far and away what I could have imagined for him. I'm so proud of him. So I'm here to ask to please keep the program, and I would ask that when you're deciding the budget, you really should look at what is essential. And I agree, food, shelter, it's essential, but for me, a close third is education, and I want my son to have the best start for kindergarten. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Lots of hands all over the room. My name is, my name is Jennifer Kuzer, and I um, am going to be talking to you about Selwood Community Center. And I first just want to thank you for the work that you do, and I really appreciate the challenge that you have in hearing all, from all of us because there are so many things we all love about our city. Um, so you have a really hard, hard job ahead of you. Um, but it's my understanding that eliminating general fund support for the Selwood Community Center would result in its closing, which would be a really big detriment to our neighborhood. This facility provides one of the few affordable, high-quality childcare options for working families in Selwood. My family relies on it for its summer camps, and I'm continually impressed by the professionalism and skill of the staff. Um, I also really appreciate its location. It's one of the few options that we have where we can bike or walk um, without having to use our car for any part of our commute. And as our neighborhood grows, we really need to maintain this facility and its program so that we can have options for a greater diversity of families. With the Boys and Girls Club moving out of Selwood, uh, we, there are even fewer options for this kind of affordable, high-quality child care. And I do recognize that there are other neighborhoods where there may be families with fewer options, uh, but I hope that you can prioritize child care and recreation where it is needed the most. I do think Selwood is one of those places because I don't want to see Selwood exclude low-income families. I'd like to see our neighborhood have more diversity in our schools and in the community center, and I hope that you can continue to fund the community center. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Iris Stone. And Get a little closer to the mic if you could. Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Uh, my name is Iris Stone, and uh, I'd like to speak about uh, the off-leash area. It's an unfenced off-leash area in Creston Park. Uh, I'm gonna, I used to run there, but I've been bitten, nipped at, and uh, aggressively approached by uh, a number of dogs, so I, I no longer run there. Uh, I do use the park a little bit because of uh, my kids, and uh, they've been chased as well. Uh, I think the problem with the unfenced uh, uh, off-leash area is that it's unenforceable. Uh, as you can see here on the map, the, uh, there is no real delineation between uh, the off-leash area and all the rest of this part, which is right next to the uh, playground. And by, it's also right next to the uh, swings. So basically this whole area becomes e, uh, the OLA and basically uh, the dogs leak onto the playground as well. Um, I'm also finding that in all the rest of the park, uh, the uh, owners are openly uh, disregarding the rules. And I have a number of pictures, but I don't think I'm going to get a chance to show you them, of you know, dogs basically everywhere in the park. Uh, I, I talk to these people and they say, it's a dog park. If you don't like it, get out. Uh, that's why we go to Mount Scott a lot more often. Um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, you know it's, uh, that's sort of what the issue is. is uh, you know, it's not being enforced. It's not, um, it's, uh, it's no, uh, the, people, the people that have their dogs there are uh, uh, disregarding the rules. 
Um, uh, my suggestion is, if, if it can be, is that uh, you know we need a fenced-in OLA if we're going to keep this park, uh, you know, uh, you know, viable. Uh, right now, it's becoming sort of a desolate, uh, menacing place. Uh, you know, you don't see people running through it because they're afraid. You don't see people, uh, uh, you know, skateboarding. You don't see the, uh, a lot of people with their kids are saying, "Where are all these dogs coming from?" Uh, I think that's endemic to the, uh, the program, and I think uh, through better uh, enforcement of the rules as they are, and finally, uh, once again, a fenced-in OLA, I think the park will become much more viable to, to the public. So thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. We're going to invite our next group up, which we have these three here. Hi there. Um, my name is Lisa Brousseau, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the uh, preschool program offered by Portland Parks and Rec. Um, I also come here tonight to speak on behalf of parents of special needs children in the greater Portland area. My son is autistic, um, and he attended preschool at the Mount Scott Community Center with Mrs. Pabersheim in the 2012 and 2013 school years. We now live in Milwaukee. When we signed up my son for preschool at age three, we were not aware of his developmental issues. And as they became more apparent over the course of the year, with him becoming very agitated in noisy situations and yelling and sometimes running from the classroom, Mrs. Palmersheim recognized that this was not a bad kid who needed to be sent home, but instead was a child who could benefit from Portland Park and Recreation's inclusion program. And she requested a personal aid for my son, both in that first year and in the next. Children with autism have difficulty navigating social situations, and my son's inclusion in the Portland Parks and Recreation preschool class gave him valuable practice with these skills at an early age. Just as importantly, is it gave his normal peers an opportunity to interact with children who move differently through the world. Although the counties offer preschool programs to children with developmental disabilities, integrating my son with normal peers gave him a better opportunity to grow and thrive. Portland Parks and Rec inclusion program is well known among parents of special needs children as a highly valuable resource, both parents who live in Portland and outside of Portland. We've had dismal experiences in other camp and child care situations. For example, my son was routinely sent home from after school care programs of the North Clackamas schools because the staff was not trained, was not equipped, and was not willing to deal with my son's issues. In the two years that Leo was in the Mount Scott preschool class, this happened only twice, and it was because of the inclusion program that's offered by Portland Parks and Rec. I just want to reiterate that the parents of special needs children really count on the inclusive attitude that has been fostered among the staff members of Portland Parks and Rec. It would be a shame if future generations of special needs preschoolers could not benefit from the inclusion program and be fully integrated with normal peers at this early age. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Marianne Schwab. I'm here today to support the right budget for ONI, including their top priority, no cuts to core programs. Preserve core community engagement and neighborhood livability services, including one, the budget office recommendations to keep the neighborhood grants. They really network in the community. I encourage you to increase the funds to the levers requested by the ONI and its partners. Don't cut the graffiti abatement services. The staff who cut would be cut to speak Spanish and are doing a marvelous job organizing among the Spanish speakers in their neighborhoods. Say no to eliminating the one FTE for crime prevention specialist. I was around when we first started Neighborhood Watch some 35 years ago. I feel that they do a fantastic job in the community and they work arm in arm with our uh, peacemakers, meaning whether they be park rangers or the Portland police. I also am very concerned about the, uh, the flap regarding our city auditor's independence. Please don't cut her program. 
she gave you a great courtesy in not issuing a federal fine for $500 to two of you. And same with the ombudsman. Anyone calling that office says, we can't because it's under the whatever commissioner's uh, portfolio. The city government's relations, Martha uh, Pellegrino, she's told you her budget is like a flea on the tail of an elephant. And that also goes for um, some others around here, including um, parks. And today I want to say thank you for your well-teamed work today with Multnomah County and the City of Portland regarding the homeless issue. I would encourage everyone to take time to key it into your computers or uh, watch it on TV. Finally, I'm asking City Council to use, uh, to purchase 1.3 acres open field facing Southeast Morrison Street. The mayor has already told us that once you lose that open space, you never get it back. It, our right of first refusal is due to expire in 2017. And for my two cents, if the OPB, uh, P Portland Public School Market rate for the 1.31 acres, I find the cause rather funding for the community center in place and not to be somewhat irrelevant. By allowing the COP access to outbuildings for homeless services in exchange financial consideration, PPS has already demonstrated the future uses for variables in their eyes. So I'm begging you to use these one time and ongoing funding. And I, I'm not gonna take the um, city auditor, the people here can tell you how much money is one time spending. We need to buy it, we need to buy it now. Every child in here, that land belongs to them. I'd rather see them run and play in that open field than see a 10 story condo. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer, and I'm here on behalf of the Selwood Community Center with my son, William. He got a little too nervous to say how much he, he loves the community center, so I'll say it for him. Um, I just wanted to add that there's a great need for after-school care in the Selwood area, especially now with the closing of the Boys and Girls Club. Um, I can't tell you um, how hard it is to get a spot for after-school care right now in that area. Um, I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning. A um, couple of weeks ago to try to get a spot in a program. It was very difficult. Um, also, there's a great need for affordable summer, summer camps in that area where we can walk our kids to um, without using um, cars, and especially for those of us with both parents that work. So, thank you very much. Hope you consider that. Thank you. Thank you all very much. We just want to recognize for those who can't see them, there are, is a whole squadron of people in red shirts here with signs that say Saves Kelsawood Community Center. Um, and signs that say preschool is important that have been waving them when we've heard testimony about the preschools and also a contingent of folks with yellow signs that say fun Oni and Ethno who have also been waving their yellow ribbon wands in response to some testimony. Now we're going to invite our youth to come up who are going to testify and uh, next up on deck will be the first three numbers that were randomly drawn. So if you have number 39, number 5, and number 105, please come down to the front so that we know you're here. If you can give me a show of hand real quick if you're number 39, 5, or 105. Good evening and welcome. Who'd like to go first? Uh, my name is Ali Rojas, and I'm here for the Portland and Recreation World Cup soccer. Mm. Um, I've been playing this this uh, program for like about four years, and and I'm, I've heard about this through a friend and how it might not happen this year, and it devastates a lot of us. I mean, we were back like three peat champions, and it's just so much fun. I've grown with these girls, and I grew up with them. And like I can say that like they're lifetime friends, you know. Like, and there's so many different communities come together, so many different um, races come together, and it's like just so much fun knowing. And you meet a lot of new people, and you have fun playing soccer at the same time. We're all there, enjoying the sport that we love, and it's just so much fun. Like, there's nothing I've ever seen so many bad, like nothing bad ever has ever happened. You know, it's just about a bunch of kids getting outside, having fun in the sun, and playing soccer. I mean, I would hate to see this go. This is about one of my favorite things to do in the summer. I could see it. I, I wait for this thing every year, and it's just so much fun. Like, how can you not, like, what people want to play? Like, just new teams coming every year, and it's just a good time, so. That's great. Thank you. Looks like you have some friends who agree with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. Go ahead, please. Hello, my name is Ethan and I am 16 years old and I sit before you today to speak on behalf of the Selwood Community Center. I sincerely believe that the Selwood Community Center is a pillar of the Selwood community. 
It has, it has provided the people access to a safe place to better themselves and others for over a century. It's a place to develop new skills, but more importantly, new relationships. I have greatly benefited from my time spent within its doors. My personal involvement in the Community Center is my participation in the Judo program. In my time training, I have formed strong bonds with the other participants to the point where I would consider them a second family. Access to the Selva Community Center has continuously brought like-minded people together and has given them a place to form lifelong friendships. Now, I live in the suburbs of Clackamas County, and as a younger child, I was seldom exposed to the interaction within a community. I understood very little about the compassion and trust neighbors can feel for one another and the community as a whole. The Selva Community Center exposed me to the compassion and goodwill that a vibrant community has to offer. In Selwood, people talk to the people of the neighborhood. They trust the people of the neighborhood, and they look out for the people of the neighborhood. That is part of why I'm here today, because of the experiences I've had in the Selwood Community Center have inspired me to make an effort to protect it. I have come to recognize that the state of Selwood's community is sacred, and I want to ensure that it is protected. So I decided to start by protecting the place where the young people begin their education in preschool and where the old go to talk and learn and all can go to play. In conclusion, I think it would be a mistake to lower the quality of life in the people of Selwood to save such a small sum of money. The institution is a pillar of the Selwood community and to remove it would be failing to serve the people and ultimately not be, be against the best interests of citizens in the city of Portland. Thank you for your time. Hi, welcome. Good evening, good evening. Just give us your name and go right ahead. Okay. My name is Anari Aja Hayes and I'm 14 years old. I'm an eighth grader at Beaumont Middle School and I'm a member of Resolutions Northwest Youth Action Team. I have been doing restorative justice since third grade when I was at regular elementary school. When I look back, I remember a time in third grade when I got into a fight with a girl because she kept pulling my hair. The rig room came about and that is when I met Tobin Crail, the restorative justice coordinator and I learned how to communicate with this other student. We talked about the situation and figured things out. I don't get in trouble anymore because I learned how to solve conflict by talking about it. Restorative justice is not about getting suspended or expelled, it's about resolving conflict. With restorative justice, you learn how to communicate and talk out issues using circles. You learn how, to, how other people's life situations, you get to bring a student's point of view into a conversation and not always just an adult's point of view. You gain leadership skills. With restorative justice, you have something to look forward to and you can help other people out. If you have a problem that day, you know that you can take care of it. Restorative justice helps in real life situations out of school too. I've heard about other schools that people seem to get in trouble more. People don't solve their problems. Education is important to us and if people keep arguing, getting into fights, then there is no point of coming to school. I remember another time this year when there were two seventh graders who were going to fight after school. I told everyone to go home and then I told teachers. The fight didn't happen. I would respectfully like to request that you continue to support restorative justice in schools so students like me have outlets to process conflicts, develop skills, and lead other youth in making the right decisions. With that request, I would like to share a poem that my friend Tala wrote. Childhood isn't just the age that you are before you turn 18, but the transformations that happen before you become an adult. In my childhood, it isn't cookies and rainbows, nor caves or death. It went from walks on the beach to birthday party cele celebrations, to my house catching into flames, to my close friends passing away. But the bad doesn't over outweigh the good, so I would just like to live my childhood. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you all. Thank you all. We're going to invite our next three panelists to come on up. And the next three random numbers that have been drawn are numbers 29, please come on up, 123, and 128. 29, 123, 128. Please come set up in the front if you're number 29, 123, or 128, so that we know you're here. Does anybody have, Go ahead. Come on up. Anybody have 39? No? Oh. Okay, welcome. Good evening. Go ahead, please. Okay, my name is Mawoto Kiole from the Tongan community, and we're here to support the new Portlanders Park uh, programs. Um, having direct uh, contact from the new Portlanders uh, Park programs, somebody, you know, like someone been sent from them to our community, and then we learn a lot more programs that we, um, our community benefit from. So uh, having uh, direct contact with our community, we do learn. Because usually when, uh, if it's advertised on P 
papers or internet, our parents or other parents of a student won't be able to uh, uh, know anything about it. So uh, having somebody from, from the New Portlanders to come to our community, we do learn and know more and benefit from, from the, those services. So uh, all we ask for you guys to uh, keep, uh, continue to funding the pro programs because uh, we do benefit mm. the Tongan community from. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, thanks very much. Good evening. My name is Lori Boyson. I'm the district manager for the Division Midway Alliance, and I serve on several East Portland community project committees, including the East Portland Neighborhood Office, EPINO's Advisory Committee. Currently, I serve on the ONIBAC as well, and after participating in that process, I'm here to advocate to you, Honorable Mayor Hales and council members, to adopt the best community engagement budget for ONI and EPNO, which includes no cuts to core community engagement services, including neighborhood small grants, graffiti abatement, and crime prevention. Last year, because of a small grant from EPNO through ONI, DMA successfully implemented a Taste of Nations tent at Midway's Festival of Nations. The Taste Tent supported eight different East Portland cultures to purchase, cook, and sell traditional foods from China, Mexico, Vietnam, Bhutan, Somalia, Ethiopia, and the Kareni and Zumi tribes from Myanmar. One Taste Tent participant is building her knowledge base in hopes of opening an Ethiopian food cart. Number two, restore ONI's accessibility fund, which allows ONI partners to offer community members language interpretation and translation, child care, bus passes for transportation, and American Sign Language for ONI and EPNO activities. Further, on behalf of EPAP, I urge City Council to create accessibility funds to allow all city bureaus the ability to provide these equitable services at city events. Number three, allocate an additional $350,000 so all ONI partners can work in consort with the Housing Bureau, Mayor's Office, and A Home for Everyone to create and implement robust public involvement efforts around the city's housing state of emergency. The housing emergency affects every Portland neighborhood and business, and homeless support efforts on behalf of Historic Park Rose and the Park Rose Neighborhood Association is a prime example of the type of on-the-ground, community-driven solutions public involvement can bring. I thank you for your time today and urge you to adopt the above budget as the ONI and EPNO budget that will build a stronger Portland through community engagement. No ONI programming cuts, restore the accessibility funds, and allocate funds to establish community engagement around the housing emergency. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Melissa Alvarez. I'm 19 years old, and I go to Warner Pacific College. I just want to take a second in the, the whole room and to look at amongst each other for a bit. And I want to say we all come from different cultures, backgrounds, and communities. And um, what this program does is that it creates a whole community. And this gives um, the youth a good, um, amazing, beautiful opportunities for us. It gives us distractions from the problems we carry and is it makes it builds us to have more friendships and connections and it creates also humbleness for all of us and um, this program defines diversity and we truly do need this the youth needs this and it, this is my fourth year in a row doing this and it has truly made me become more humble and it's also have made me learn to be resilient. Hmm. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you again. Want to recognize all the jazz hands in the room. About 30 or 40 white signs in the back that say, "Add parks for New Portlanders. Keep your promise. Immigrants and refugees matter." Other things and lots of ribbons going around the room. Also, we're going to invite the next panelist to come up. I think we're missing number 120, <laughs> 123. If you have 123, come up now, or you're going to miss your turn. Um, and then next on deck, we're going to have um, our first invited panel of testimony from our Russian-speaking Portlanders, and that's Natalia Sobleyevska. 
Galina Nekrasova and Artem Velichko. We'll ask you to come on deck to the new seats. If number 123 has not appeared, we're going to invite number 133 to come up to the mic. 133? Raise your hand so we can see you if you have number 133. 133, anywhere? All right, we're going to move on then to number 41. Number 41. So you've got number 41, we'll invite you to come on up to the mic. And while he's doing that, why don't you go ahead and get started. Well, hello, commissioners and mayor. My name is Annette Stanhope, and I'm the chair of the Park Rose Neighborhood Association. I'm also involved in the East Portland Neighborhood Office Advisory Committee, East Portland Neighbors, Inc., and the Rovers. I'm here today to ask you to fund the Office of Neighborhood Involvement's request for community engagement around the houselessness emergency. This request is inspired by the work I have been doing with Historic Park Rose, our Neighborhood Prosperity Initiative, St. Matthew's Episcopal Church, Officer Jason Jones, and the East Portland Neighborhood Office to find ways for the unhoused community to co coexist with housed residents in the Park Rose neighborhood. Within our limited resources, we've begun to connect with the houseless, identify public areas where they could reside, and develop garbage pickup and public toilet services. And we're also working on a social resources fair on June 2nd to help the houseless connect to social services that could help them improve their situations. However, this small bit of progress has taken much of our time and local resources, and there are other East Portland neighborhoods who could use assistance in helping their own unhoused communities. We in Park Rose are at capacity of what we can do as well, and we could do even more with more assistance from the city. For example, this is just one example, perhaps a new staff position to help manage developments with garbage, garbage toilet and storage services in East Portland. Uh, it's a ch changing scene out there all, all the time, and it's hard to follow that as just a volunteer. Uh, the neighborhood associations are often the next point of contact after the police regarding houseless, houselessness issues, which is why it is important to fund the Office of Neighborhood Involvement request around the houselessness emergency. Thank you for listening and considering my request. Thank you for the work that you and your neighbors have been doing. We appreciate it. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Peter Parks. I live in North Portland, and I'm here representing VOST Workers' Rights Education Project, which has the Day Labor Center. We understand that there's strong support among commissioners and in the mayor's office to ensure that VOST receives funding for the next fiscal year, and we appreciate that support, as well as the historical support from folks in City Hall that has been instrumental in our success and longevity. However, we still understand, we also understand that there is some uncertainty about where VOS will fit into the budget moving forward. We want to be clear that facing uncertainty about our funding every year is harmful to our work and can be very disheartening. We know that the commissioners and the mayor understand and value our work. Still, we feel it necessary to share what we know. The Martin Luther King Jr. Worker Center is an invaluable asset to this city, and it serves a population of Portlanders who are acutely vulnerable to exploitation and inequity. We ask that the commissioners and the mayor continue to support and invest in this community, and that they work with us to find an appropriate place in the budget for votes to be funded on an ongoing basis. We'd also like to thank our partners at PDC, particularly Commission Chair Tom Kelly and Business and Social Equity Director John Jackley for their recent promise of a long-term lease for the property the MLK Worker Center occupies. Thank you all again for your support and your time. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome. Hi. Um, I'm Katie Lee, and this is Winston, and Greta's down there on the floor. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Selwood Community Center. Um, our family lives in Selwood. My um, husband and I work very hard to um, be able to afford to live in a tiny 700 square foot house with our two kids and we had a giant Great Dane and we're all squished in there because we love the neighborhood so much. Selwood is such an important special place um, and um, the Selwood Community Center is a big part of what makes it so special. Um, we wouldn't know half the people in our neighborhood if it weren't for the Selwood Community Center. Um, my son goes to preschool there, and I'm hoping that my daughter, Greta, goes there next year. Um, Selwood's a rare place in Portland where kids actually grow up together from preschool and go to school together all through elementary school, 
um, high school and the families really grow roots there. So um, it's just a really special place and it all starts with Selwood Community Center. You know, with the great preschool and early childhood programs there. Um, and yep, and his friend goes there too. Um, and so I just want to ask that you please consider um, not taking away such a special, safe, nurturing place for our community. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you very much. Lots of jazz hands and signs for Save Silwood Community Center up here in the front, probably at least 20 or 30 or more of you. We're going inv to invite our invited testimony from our Russian-speaking community to come on up to the front. And next on deck will be the next three randomly, randomly drawn numbers, number 15, number 37, and number 1. So 15, 37, and 1. If you have those numbers, please do come to the front so we know you're here and ready to go. And with that, we'll turn over to you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Natalia Sabalevska. I'm with the uh, Russian-speaking community leaders group, and we ask uh, uh, you, <clears throat> we ask to fully fund and not cut the budget for the mobile playground program and the movie in the park. Uh, both of these programs are very important to our Russian-speaking community um, because the public uh, mobile playground uh, keep our kids up. <clears throat> active through whole summertime, and um, it will improve uh, their health and uh, prevent obesity. Uh, the movie in the park in the Russian language uh, is an event which gathers our community and is not just a cultural event, but an um, event that shows that city officials care about immigrant communities and support people in their culture needs and activities. And a previous year with, when we um, did a movie in the park, each event, it was two times, and each event uh, gathered 250 people. You know, it's like uh, there's some um, activities, food, and uh, just very um, good, and I heard uh, uh, last year was 50 f uh, budgeted 56 mo uh, movies, and this year will be 40, and next year we don't know how many, you know, and uh, please keep uh, um, funded. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. My name is Galina Nikrasova. I am from uh, Russian-speaking community leaders group from Russian-speaking uh, compatriots association, and it is big community. Uh, we ask you to find a funds uh, for creating a training program for police officers, especially for Russian-speaking community. In this training, the police officers will learn how to communicate with our community effective and cultural appropriate. They will learn where and how to reach our people to prevent and clarify any criminal activities and how to influence and help those people, especially youth, who are already in difficult situations and get out and stand back on their feet in regular life. That I ask. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Artem Velichko. I'm currently a student at Portland State University studying business and history. But 13 years ago, I was a seventh and eighth grader right here at Alice Middle School. So it's great to be back with my wonderful leaders group here to ask you to commit funding for the newcomer integration practice position. This full-time staff will help the current new Portland program coordinator, Polo, the, to manage and integrate the policy for the new Portland Policy Commission. Maybe you already know, but if you did not, did you know that one out of every five Portlanders are foreign born and 50% of school children are ethnic or language minorities? This new position in the new Portlander Policy Commission will be a great addition to the mayor's city structure. Mayor, mayor Hales has already graciously authorized this one-time special funding for the position last year, but the city has not yet to create this position, and the money might be gone by June 30th. So. Um, we're here to ask you, and there is proven history and success with the new Portlanders program. Um, there have been 13 local, international, and national honors over the last eight years recognized. Thank you all for your time and letting us speak here with you all. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now we need uh, three more. We, you folks go ahead up here. Come on up, come on up. Now we have three more numbers. Number 45, number 119, and number 52. Could those folks come down and be on deck here in the reserve seats that we have for you right up front? 45, 119, and 52. I don't see anybody moving. Can you raise your hand real quick if you have one of those numbers so we know you're here? Otherwise, we're going to call three more numbers. 45, 119, 52. Last chance. Okay. Going once, twice. Then we're going to move on to number 43, number 127, and number 125. 43, 127, and 125. Please come to the front if you have one of those numbers and raise your hand so we know you're here. Okay, I have one in the back. I have one hand here, maybe. Maybe that was a kid. Okay. All right, welcome. Can you hear me? Yes. Sarah Neal, and I am a longtime resident in Southeast Portland, and I'm uh, a frequent user of the Mount Scott Recreation Center Aquatics Program, and I use uh, that program to manage my chronic pain. Also, my grandchildren love to swim there. And the two cuts that I hope will not happen is there's a plan to cut the open play swim, and this is three evenings a week and is actually the only evening play swim uh, for children and families. Also, the lap swim is an all-ages lap swim from one to four, Monday through Friday, and that would be eliminated. So aquatics programs are very important for the health of our children. Also, when they are playing uh, and getting great exercise, they're also learning water safety, which could be life-saving in their future. I inquired of the aquatics director just how much uh, revenue we might be losing by not having uh, the open swim and the play swim. And with a, just a brief calculation, usually using one week and then uh, adding or multiplying that by the weeks left uh, in the year. She came up with a high estimate of up to $50,000 in lost revenue. This, this would mean that other cuts could happen to the program as well. Um, I did notice that in the aquatics program that are slated to be cut, that they are all in, south, they're in southeast Portland, northeast Portland, and North Portland. These are all areas with low income families and one of the goals of the Park Bureau is to increase equity and access. Hello Buckman Pool, <laughs> hello Matt Dishman. Uh, so I hope that you will fully, fully fund the aquatics programs. Thank you. Good evening, welcome. Good evening. My name is Michael Schommler, and I'm a leader for the Argate Park Rose Neighborhood Emergency Team, or NET, and I'm here to speak in favor of budget support for the Portland Bureau of Emergency Management and the NET program. Unlike many Portland residents, I've had the opportunity to experience um, a large-scale natural disaster. When I was a young teenager living in Alaska, uh, the 1964 earthquake hit. So I've had a chance to see how uh, resources and services that we come to rely on can disappear in a matter of minutes. I understand what life is like waking months for basic utilities and services to be restored. With its relative uh, absence of large scale frequent natural disasters, I worry about how few Portlanders would be prepared for such an event and that's why I prepare. Uh, and Portland Bureau of Emergency Management probably represents the greatest asset the city possesses for mitigating destruction and loss that will occur. In addition to recognizing the Bureau's efforts to prepare us for unusual disasters, however, I think it's important not to lose sight of the immense value that the NET program has for building community on a daily basis within Portland. While programs that build community within my neighborhood association and school district are certainly valuable, the notion of community in the context of disaster preparedness is much larger. 
Many of us NET members have benefited immensely from working with neighbor leaders, not only across uh, neighborhood boundaries, but across lines of religion, race, cultural difference, and economic circumstances. These distinctions will have little meaning when, a, a, when a, an emergency occurs. This program therefore achieves something I believe few community development programs can claim, a citywide ongoing conversation among citizens about a topic of critical importance to them, the safety and welfare of their families. Again, I strongly encourage you to continue robust support for Portland Bureau of Emergency Management. Thank you, thank you very much. Good evening, welcome. Good evening, members of the City Hall. First of all, I would like to say which in my native tongue means thank you for welcoming me here today. I'm extremely honored and humbled to be able to share my story with you all. My name is Erica Eitzen. I am here on behalf of On College Possible requesting to be included into the city's budget. I am currently a freshman at Portland State University and this year will be my third year with the wonderful College Possible program. Today, I would like to share a preview of my journey and how College Possible has contributed to the student and woman I am today. Growing up, my parents emphasized the importance of higher education and how it will greatly assist not only my family, but my country. Both my parents did not have the opportunity to attend college and were first to work, forced to work challenging jobs in order to provide for my siblings and I. Due to financial issues, my family was forced to relocate every other year, which affected my education greatly. During my sophomore year of high school, I decided that college was not going to be a dream, but I was going to make it a reality. The only problem that stood in my way was how I was out of how was I, out of all people, going to go to college? I knew absolutely nothing about the process of admissions, applications, the ACT, and requirements. As I was struggling to find guidance, my counselor referred me to the College Possible program. Being a part of the College Possible family has helped me excel not only academically, but also socially and culturally. My junior and senior year of high school, I was given the guidance and tools that helped me graduate high school and prepared me for college. Through ACT practices, study groups, and volunteering, I was able to excel academically while creating a family bond against my classmates and coaches. My wonderful coach and friend Brianna went beyond her duties to make sure I was choosing the perfect college and prepared me for my new journey. During the college process, Brianna reminded me to keep an open mind and explore my options. Taking her advice, I applied to PSU and I didn't think much of it. PSU is a small university too close to home, what would I gain out of that? After receiving my financial aid package from my dream school, I realized that I was not going to be able to afford it. My only choice now was PSU. When I submitted my application, I was rejected and was given the option to submit an appeal. I thought it was the end of the world and that I was never going to attend college. My coach motivated me to not give up and write my appeal. After many rough drafts and revisions, I submitted my appeal and was accepted. Currently, I am still receiving the assistance and support from my college possible coach, Yvette, that is helping me greatly during my first year. Knowing that I have a friend and mentor available to me at all times help me, helps me feel more comfortable and confident. I am currently involved in various student organizations on campus and I truly believe that I found my perfect school. If it was not for the College Possible program, I would not be able to achieve my goals today. With the help of my College Possible coaches, I am able to be the confident student that stands before you today. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Lots of jazz hands around well, the room. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to invite our next two <clears throat> panelists to come up. We went through a lot of numbers that no one claimed, so we're moving on to number 107. Do you have 107? Raise your hand high if you're 107. Come up to the mic, please. Thank you. And on deck, we'll have our next panel of invited testimony from the Oregon Bhutanese Community yeah, Organization thanks. with Deo Bandari, Chet Gamiri, and Surya Joshi. Please come on up to the front. Welcome, good evening. Go right ahead. Hello, um, I'm Zawadi Doti and I'm from Cleveland High School. I'm 17 and I'm here representing Poland World Cup. Uh, last year was my first year joining the Poland World Cup and uh, the experience that I had was really amazing because uh, we all know that soccer is an international sport and that it helps a lot of people unite. World Cup, while I was in World Cup, Soccer World Cup uh, team, I joined the current team and I met a lot of people who, from different countries, which was really amazing. And I got to see a lot of different cultures and experience and ask questions about, about like, my friends' cultures and ask them how is it like in their country and how, what experiences do they have and how they learn soccer and, and, where, and who t taught them. And it was really interesting because when I was, while we were playing the games, even though it was like, it's supposed to be comp competitive, this, the people were like, com 
came together and talked about the cultures and just communicated together, being nice and just laughing, having fun. And it was really awesome to see how, even though we're all different, we all came together and just enjoying soccer and just realizing that we had the same similarity and just like, wow, we really like soccer and, and we share that similarity so we should come together, learn to be good at it, and then just keep teaching each other what we need to, to um, what we need to focus on getting better. And I would have hope, hopefully next, this year, we have another World Cup soccer, because I really want to meet new people from different countries and learn new languages, maybe, hopefully, and uh, get to learn about the cultures so that I can know what it means to be um, Kareni or Nepali or Ethiopian or Kenyan or Somalian. So, because I, I really want to know what like it means to be from a different country, what it means to be um, a student from a third world country to live here. Although I know I want to know from a different perspective, from another culture, because I really, I, my, my dream is to travel around the world and, and meeting new people from different countries really helps because it helps you explore the differences between America and the country that I live, which is Kenya or Ethiopia. And you get to meet a lot of cool people who talk about the experience in the different languages they learn. And I think World Cup really helps because it, it expands your experience and like, lets you know what you, what you need to know and gives you knowledge about soccer and just making new friends. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kara Carmesino, and I'm here representing the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon, or APANO. Over the last three years, APANO has been leading the Jade District Neighborhood Prosperity Initiative. One cornerstone of our work is the former furniture store on the corner of Southeast 82nd and Division, which has become a thriving community space. Last year, a $20,000 investment through PDC's Community Development Fund allowed us to support a range of activities from Tai Chi classes to a Vision Zero press conference to our own youth organizing programs, ethnic studies campaign launch, and hundreds more, engaging a wide swath of community members and, of course, local residents. To allow for our ongoing operation of the space, a second one-time investment from PDC would support the incredible range of community building, engagement, and organizing this space makes possible. We also support funding for the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability's action plan to mitigate displacement that may result from proposed transit projects along Powell and Division, and the Parks for New Portlanders program specifically designed to help integrate immigrant and refugee families. Apano has also been active on the Office of Neighborhood Involvement Budget Advisory Committee, and you have heard from us before around our support for your investment in culturally specific leadership development through the Diversity and Civic Leadership Program. We were enthusiastic about this council's support for the addition of a sixth DCL program last fiscal year and celebrate our partners Momentum Alliance in winning the resulting RFP. We strongly support the right budget for ONI to prevent cuts to core community engagement services, retain positions, and increase accessibility. At the same time, APANA represents a variety of diverse constituents. When data is disaggregated for our communities, a range of disparities is uncovered. Because of this, we want to continue to raise um, the importance of a program that serves our communities in a culturally specific way, building on our histories and experiences. Given the potential cuts and important priorities this year, we're not advocating for further expansion of the DCL program, but we do look forward to com coming back in a future year to discuss that possibility with ONI and with you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <coughs> Welcome. My name is Joyce Light. I am a volunteer uh, in many capacities in East Portland. <laughs> Perhaps the most uh, thing that I like the best, the thing that's easiest to volunteer for, that is the most fun I've ever done in my life is being a Portland Rover. And that activity <laughs> takes me into the parks of East Portland. I have so much passion, I cannot channel it into two minutes, so I force myself to write a letter, and I can read that, and I'll think I can keep it in the line of time. Uh, as I said, I'm a resident of East Portland. I live in Wilkes Community Group, which is a neighborhood association in East Portland. First, I want to thank the council for their past funding support of community building, activi building activities through 
the Office of Neighborhood Involvement, ONI, through their budget for community building grants. My request to the Portland City Council is for continued funding of the Office of Neighborhood Involvement Community Building Grants. These small grants afford neighborhood associations with opportunities to participate in Portland Parks and Recreation's summer free-for-all events. Although PPNR is diligent at keeping costs down, not all neighborhoods can continue with neighborhood night out and movies in the park events without the financial assistance provided through the small grants. There are other purposes that neighborhoods may use these funds for, but summer free-for-all and neighborhood night out events focus directly on activities for children and families. Bringing residents and families together is essential to building healthy neighborhoods. Con continuing to provide small grant funding options for supportive neighborhood activities may seem to be a small investment in community. However, the smallness of dollar amount does not diminish the, the critical value that is added to community and neighborhood vitality. I thank you for consideration of this request for continued funding of ONI's budget for community grant building grants. And the East Portland Rovers also thank you. We thank you. Thank you all very much. Lots of jazz hands and yellow ribbons around the room. And just recognizing a lot of you came organized with a particular group, and many of you are supporting many of the topics that are coming up for a testimony tonight. We're going to invite up our representatives from the Oregon Bhutanese Community Organization. And next on deck will be the next three randomly drawn numbers, which are numbers 132. Raise your hand high if you have it. Number one, 24, 132, 24, and 100. Let's see if you have them. 132. 124. Come on up to the front. I'm sorry, not 24, just 24. Do I see a hand for 24? And 100. 100? Okay, I don't hear 24, so we're going to move on to the next number, which is 24. How about 132? Did we have 132 in the room? 132? Great. Good evening, welcome. Uh, uh. Uh, Mayor Hales and Commissioner, good evening. My name is Surya Joshi. I work at IRCO, uh, Immigrant and Refugee Community Organization, as a housing coordinator. Uh, I would like to request you to, to dedicate budget for a, for a, for a, a, a Portland uh, Police Bureau unit that would deal exclusively with outreach with immigrant and refugee community with a dedicated unit, Portland uh, Police Bureau can build hands-on cultural competence skill. It will also help Portland Police Bureau to, to, to develop uh, protocols and partner with community-based organizations like IRCO, Lutheran Community Services, Catholic Charities, Latino Networks to outreach with our ever-growing immigrant uh, uh, population and also to keep our city safer. I worked with officer uh, Natasha Hansberger to give community safety workshop for various refugee communities back in 2014 and 15. It helped to build an environment of trust with police. Uh, when a Somali teenager went missing in 2015 and, and there were worries about his potential radicalization, uh, this family, because of their prior uh, engagement with Portland police, uh, because of Officer Hansberger, was able to ask for help with police, and the teen was uh, reunited with the family without any problem. So these are the situations that we face in our community every day, and then our teenagers are very much afraid to, 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 to befriend police officers, and then they, they are shy of police officer. We need this trust to be continued to keep our city safe. Uh, uh, Officer Hansberger is doing everything on her own, but this work needs to be institutionalized in a city that is 20% foreign-born population. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor Hills and Commissioners. My name is Dev Bhandari. I'm the current president of the Oregon Bhutanese Community Organization. I also work as a youth advocate for new immigrants and refugees youth and within David Douglas School District. I came to Portland in 2015 after living in a refugee camp for 23 years. 
As you can imagine, there's a lot to learn for newcomers. I was fortunate to give, go through a free leadership program at IRCO and learn how to interact with the public systems. With IRCO's support, Bhutanese community just filed 51C3 non-profit organization status in Oregon. I have the com communication between families and school. I empower community members to get help from the pro bono attorneys when they are harassed by their landlord and treated unfairly. I'm asking your support today for an immigrant and refugee integration practice staff for the new Portlanders program in city so that he or she can address our challenges. And having this staff person will ensure newcomers are integrated into a new society as contributing members. Thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, City Commissioners, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chet Gimire. I am former Vice President of Oregon Buddhist Community Organization. Six years ago, with my family, I traveled from Nepal refugee camp to this wonderful country. Being in Portland, I found housing is so expensive in our hometown. Almost all newcomer families are renters. Therefore, uh, they are in housing crisis. Though there are affordable housing for low-income families, but people have to be in a waiting list for a long period of time. In fact, we have many immigrant communities sharing apartments or living in a crowded situation. Let me give, give you an example we faced in our Bhutanese community. We had an elderly couple suddenly became homeless because they had to live an overcrowded apartment which they were sharing with other family. We had to run over time knocking doors in our community to house this couple. Now they are sharing a rented apartment with another family temporarily, paying whatever cash they get as SSI benefit. Henceforth, we invite city government to take the matter as important one and discuss how our families can begin a stable life in Portland. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you having your delegation. Here. All right, thank you folks. Thank you very much for sharing. The next group, we need to have you come up and sit in front. Thank you. And then we have three new numbers. Number 17, number 102, and number two. Can we see your hands out there and make your way up to the front here? Come on down. 17, 102, and two. I see two people. Is there a third? Then the next right. number will ne be. Go ahead. Can we find them? Uh, sorry. Speaker. Number 31. Do we have number 31? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good evening and welcome. Yes, thank you. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Commissioner, and everybody. I am SB. Uh, from Zomi community. I am from, I come from Burma, Myanmar, and from the northwest part of our country, I um, mean Burma, Myanmar, and then border to India. And I speak on behalf of the uh, New Polanders. We don't have country, we don't have state, we don't have city, but we have a country called USA, we have a, a state called Oregon. We have a city called Portland. Thank you so much for welcoming all the, um, in the newcomers here. Thank you very much for your help. But it comes to our notice that the sport, especially the uh, Portland uh, World Cup soccer, is not included in the budget in uh, 2016 and 17. To feel a home, a city, that we, uh, we call our CD. We need the Portland so World Cup soccer to be included in your budget for 2016, 2017. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. 
Hello, you got it. It's me. Uh, er, hello, everyone in Karen. So first of all, I want to thanks for giving me a really good opportunity to introduce myself. My name is HMA, and I am from Thailand refugee camp. So I grew up in a poverty environment. So I, I live in a refugee camp. It's like living in a prison because I can't go anywhere or make my own decisions. And I never have a, such a great opportunity in anything. So. I came here to, repre uh, to represent the Portland World Cup. W World Cup. Um, Portland World Cup bring a lot of, such a great opportunity. I learned a lot from this. When I came here, I don't know anything. I can't, even my first day of school, I went to school, I cried the whole week, and it was bad. I can't even imagine anything for that. But when I, when I heard about this Portland World Cup, I don't know anything, but I can still communicate by kicking the ball with p people. I can't just, I can't just, I just communicate by kicking the ball by feet by feet. Although I don't know anything, all I know is like running and kick the ball, and that's how I communicate and make friends. And now I can speak English a little bit. I just want to speak up, and I know I sound very nervous, but, <laughs> but. <laughs> Um, yeah, and okay, okay. and soccer it's such a popular uh, sport. Like, so it it's a world sport, sport, and we all know that. And we, I can't even like I'm very passionate about it. And I I don't really have a lot to say because it's just so amazing, and I want to keep this program. And thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We think you had a lot to say, so thank you very much. <laughs> Good evening. Great job. Good evening. Hola. Hello. Good evening. Um, my name is Maria Fernanda Diaz Bonilla. I want to take a quick moment if anybody who's here to support the New Portlanders program and woke up to stand up, just, um, just so we can see how much, how much people can come to us present. Shit. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> on to my speech. <laughs> um, I'm here to testify for the Paris Union Prolongers Program. Um, the program has created great opportunities for the community, more in particular the immigrant and refugee families and youth to come together and help them integrate into Portland through the Portland Parks and Recreation System. One of these, these opportunities is a Portland World Cup soccer tournament. The tournament takes place in the summer, and last summer I was fortunate enough to be a part of this tournament. It was great to see all of these teams, players, and families come together for their love of the sport, soccer. In total, there were 28 teams, 500 youth and families. That was a lot. <laughs> the communities represented were so diverse, it was like the whole globe was there those two marvelous days. To be more exact, there were 30 different cultural communities that attended. To name a few, the Burmese, Burmese, Iraqis, Congolese, Hispanic, and Latino communities all came to play. Through my years of working and being involved in the community of Portland, I have never seen a program that can bring together 30 different cultural communities together and help them integrate into their new home that is Portland. As an immigrant who came to this country 12 years ago, I would have loved to have an opportunity like this. This program gives the chance of a welcoming and easier transition to new immigrant and refugee families. It gives them the chance to see Portland as their home. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you all. Good job. Thank you. I invite the three of you to come on up, and we'll call our next three random numbers. Please raise your hand so we can tell if you're here. Number 31. Yes. Number 129, 129. Number 40, 40, 40. I do not see it, They've got you. Okay, the three of you, please come down to the front. Okay, welcome. Give it a moment. Try it now. 
Can you hear me now? There you go. <laughs> um, so I would like to start with saying thank you to the members of City Hall for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I am here on behalf of College Possible, requesting to be included in this year's proposed budget. Um, my name is Yvette Perez Chavez, and I am currently doing a year of service as an America member um, with College Possible as a college coach. Um, today, I would like to share with you a little of what I do and the reasons why I chose to do this year of service. Um, the main objective as a college coach is to help students navigate any struggles they may do, be dealing with, whether they are personal, academic, or financial, while they are in school, in order to ensure that they will be successful in their college career. Every single one of my students know that they have a coach they can turn to, even on the weekends and outside of work hours, they know I'm here. This may not seem like much at first glance, but it makes a world of difference for students who have nobody in the home that they can go to who understands where they are coming from. I know this from personal experience because I used to be that student on the other side of the mentoring relationship. Four out of the five years I spent in college, I was a part of TRIO SSS, which is a student support program aimed at helping low-income, first-generation students and students with disabilities be successful in college. When I began my academic journey, I had no clue what I was doing and wasn't sure that I actually belonged in college. Both of my parents are immigrants from Mexico and have less than an elementary level education. They had no understanding of the higher education system and how it could be used as a tool to break the cycle of poverty we were living in. Out of five siblings, me being the youngest, I'm the first to graduate with a four-year degree. Two of my older siblings dropped out of college within the first semester, and the other two never completed high school. There was never an expectation for me to go to school or do well academically. It was always to start working and earning money to contribute to the family. It wasn't until I joined the TRIO program that I was able to explore my capabilities as a student. It was the persistence of my counselors telling me to strive that made me realize my full potential. If you were to look at my high school transcripts compared to my resume today, you wouldn't believe they belonged to the same person. The support and guidance my mentors gave me was life-changing, and I would not have accomplished what I have if it wasn't for their support. I chose to become a college coach to honor those who helped me and show the students I work with who come from similar backgrounds that the circumstances they are born into do not define their potential. It is an honor to work with the students from Portland's 2015 graduating class, and I hope to see College Possible expand the relationship with the city and for its public schools. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hello, my name is Ken Diener. Um, as you can see, I'm here for supporting Buckman Pool. Um, this is a, a continuation of a 12-year testimony and process. Um, what I have handed out tonight is a two-page chart um, of something that I, I dug up from 2013 budget hearing process um, that started with um, the idea that what we've been hearing was that Buckman Pool was one of the most expensive pools in the city. Uh, with the chart that we found from the 2012 Portland Parks budget numbers, uh, we found out that P P Buckman Pool was actually a very good deal and is actually the least expensive pool in many, many categories across the board. Uh, what I've just gotten was the 2014 update from the, this year's Portland Parks budget. And the good news continues. Um, there's lots of numbers to look at, but in summary, Revenues have gone up from 56 to 69 thousand dollars in those two years. Visits have actually increased by 50 percent in those two years. Maintenance costs have actually gone down, um, which is interesting. Um, when you look at a lot of these numbers, and, I, and again, I apologize that this is a very specific uh, way of looking at the excuse me at the P Buckman pool, uh, but. There's a lot of uh, interesting and very valuable things to, to see um, with these numbers. So um, the Buckman Pool is the only uh, year-round pool that has been gathered into these numbers up top with the, uh, with the summer programs, which obviously doesn't, doesn't work apples to apples, and it's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to look at Buckman Pool across the board in relation to the other pools. But we have the lowest maintenance costs, zero utility costs. We have the lowest programming costs, the lowest overhead costs. Um, 
our total costs are half of the Columbia pool and four times less than East Portland pool. And yet we're providing services and there's a value to the entire community. And we have other people that can testify for other, those other reasons. So for all of those reasons, I encourage you to look into these numbers further and realize that, Buck, that Buckman Pool is a very, very good deal for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, my name is Ron Glanville and uh, commissioners and mayor, thank you for being here in East Portland. I live, uh, I'm a volunteer and I'm a chair uh, for the Russell Neighborhood Association. I'm also the recording secretary of East Portland Neighbors, which is a nonprofit that serves the East Portland Neighborhood Association's uh, office. And I'm also on the chair of the East Portland Neighborhood Association News, which you see. So you've heard East Portland quite a bit here. Um, I'm here today to talk about the East Portland Neighborhood Office support and that of Oni and the Oni budget and need for ongoing funding for its programs and projects. Specifically, I'm here to talk about the Neighborhood Association's coalition formed to provide neighborhood cleanup events in East Portland. Our coordinated events, that will, which will be in April and May of this, this year, uh, there are going to be several. A, a group of volunteers and organizers of neighborhood associations joined together to help each other out and to use our resources and funding to provide an efficient and coordinated cleanup efforts starting later this month and into May. It encompasses six cleanups. During this period, it coordinates nine cleanup events during the, six, the 2016 calendar year. This coalition participates in advertising, volunteer labor, equipment, transportation, coordinating the physical aspects of the cleanup, sponsorship of various other organizations, communication to school and neighborhoods via electronic news flyers and newsletters. You'll read more about this coalition in uh, this newspaper I've just distributed, which is now in its, just came out, will be mailing it to 67,000 households in East Portland. And you'll see it um, um, a cleanup page on page 10 about it. It's important to know that these innovations are using the funding that, that are provided by the city and that we, uh, we're doing it better probably than anybody else in any other neighborhood. So I, I encourage you to continue funding East Portland Neighborhood Office and ONI. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I think you'll invite the next three of you to come up. I think we have one shared testimony where they'll be dividing the two minutes. Please come on up to the mics. Uh, between a couple of people and then our next on deck will be our final set of invited testimony from the new Portlander youth leaders. We have Ramon Rendon, Terry Agana, and Mateo Morales. If you'll please come up to the front. Thank you. Good evening, Nancy. Hi there. You're on. <laughs> Well, hello, Mayor Hales and Commissioners. Um, my name is Nancy Walsh, and I'm a longtime resident of Selwood, Moreland, and a current SMILE board member and committee member of the Friends of Selwood Community Center. <laughs> I, I was also lucky enough during my 30-year career with Portland Parks to be assigned to Selwood Community Center twice. First time, fresh out of college in 1973, and again in the 1990s as the recreation supervisor for the center and nearby parks. While I was at Oregon State uh, as a major in recreation, our professors and teachers aides emphasized how important recreation and leisure, and leisure services were in a person's daily life. I witnessed many of the positive as aspects of recreation firsthand at Selwood Community Center. Teamwork, problem solving, physical well-being, cooperation, creativity, and most of all, a real sense of community. Generations of Portlanders have passed through the doors of Selwood Community Center, becoming better athletes, artists, dancers, musicians, and people. The four existing, four existing regional centers that we have are wonderful, but Inner Southeast doesn't have one yet. Except for Selwood Community Center, almost all of Inner Southeast is a recreation desert. Until summer months when the outdoor pools are open, Buckman is open, and the parks can be used. I urge you to find the $80,000 a year needed to offset the Selwood Community Center's operational costs 
and show that the City of Portland is serious about its investment in its neighborhoods. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good to see you. Well, welcome. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Larry Tu, and I am Vice Principal at Ron Russell Middle School here in the David Douglas School District. And I'm here to speak on behalf of continued funding for the School Resource Officers, our SRO program here. For those of you that don't know, the SROs, the School Resource Officers, are Portland police officers assigned specifically to work with um, a particular school district. Here in David Douglas, we have nine elementary schools, three middle schools, and the largest high school in the state, and we are serviced by two school resource officers. And losing these SROs would be a huge blow to our school and to our district. The SOR, SROs are definitely a part of our school community. They know our students, they know our school policy, they know our expectations, and the students get to know and get to trust these officers. They see them in their elementary school, then when they get to middle school, and then on into high school. When we do ask the SROs to come talk to our students about a particular episode or incident, um, or we, sometimes we ask them to come and talk to students about the consequences of, you know, what might happen if they continue on the path that they are on. It's nice because these, these officers have established a relationship with our students and the students know them and trust them. They're not some strangers coming in and dealing with them. If we had to rely solely on calling the non-emergency police line, we would lose a lot of the connections and the consistency that our SROs have established with our students and our schools over the years. Our school resource officers have demonstrated the ability to work well with our students. They have specifically been assigned there because they want to work with kids, but also to work with our parents and our staff. And I'd hate to see these relationships that, they, that have been developed um, with our school district go away. I think it would do a great disservice to the David Douglas School District, and I hope that there can continue to be room made in the budget for school resource officers for our students and for our schools. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. Hello, my name is Shane Bassett. I'm principal at Gilbert Heights Elementary School. This is Ava Moore Gonzalez, one of our students, and her mother, Sarah Moore Gonzalez. Um, we are here to talk in support of arts in the schools. Uh, we are specifically here to talk about our support of the arts tax and what it has provided. Um, in David Douglas School District, the art tax provides the equivalent of nine full-time elementary music specialists who teach a curriculum to K-5 students. Without the arts tax, our school district would not be able to afford these teachers, so our district thanks uh, you sincerely for providing those resources to us. Um, also, um, I would like to say that um, we have had an incredible positive experience with our students in music. I could tell you about how engaged they are, how it makes um, their instruction culturally relevant. I could show you pictures of 575 guests we had at a music program last week. Um, I could tell you about how we have a, a thousand students demonstrating excellence in music in middle and high school because of our strong elementary program due to the arts tax. Um, what I really wanna say tonight though is that um, the jobs of schools are to expose students to a wide variety of experiences, help them find a passion for what suits them. Our job is to affect the heart, inspire the souls of the students uh, so that they will engage and never even think of dropping out. Um, state funding sources are not uh, providing the resources for this. The arts tax has graciously filled that void. To schools, muter, uh, music and other arts matter. I'd like to invite Ava and Sarah to share briefly about their experience. My name is Ava and I'm 11 years old and I just wanted to say that I love music. What I like best about it is it really makes me enthusiastic and excited to go to school. I have learned so much from my music specialist and like how to read music. It is a whole new language. I have learned that I can express my feelings appropriately through music. Without music class, I would be less motivated to go to school. To me, music really matters. Mm, thank you. <clears throat> I wanted to say that I value music education in our schools. As a piano teacher myself, I am proud to be a part of a district and a resident in a city where music and other arts are prioritized. Thank you for providing arts tax revenue to our district so that we can continue to provide high quality music education to our children. Thank you, thank you all very much. Leaders from the 
New Portland youth. New Portland youth leaders are gonna come on up and next on deck are randomly drawn numbers 49, 46, and 114. Do I see 49? Show me your hand if you have 49. 46, number 46. Number 114, 114. So number 114, show me your hand, otherwise I'm gonna call another number. I do not see hands for any of those numbers, so I'm gonna move on to number 19. Number 19, show me your hand if you're here, number 19. How about number eight? Number eight. See, maybe a lot of people have left already. Number 28. Number 28. Number 27. All right, we have 27. How about number 35? If you still want to speak, check your numbers. Number 35. About number 14. Number 14, come on down. Okay. Good evening. Welcome. Hi, my name is Carrie Anagana, and I am the founder of Santos United Outreach Soccer Club here in Portland. With the hopes of possibly asking you to please continue funding the Portland World Cup for New Portlanders. As an immigrant, when you're coming into a new country, it's very difficult to fit in right away. And by watching these kids participate in the Portland World Cup, I've seen these kids, different languages, different cultures, different backgrounds, where they're able to let themselves go and share the same passion that all the other kids come to the Portland World Cup for is soccer. It also provides a special bonding that I've seen these kids have with the Portland World Cup. It also provides for connection, networking. This particular program also was great for me networking and when I go into the Portland World Cup. I'm able to reach out to more kids than I do now to help. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good evening. Hi, good evening to everybody. My name is Ramon Rendon. I'm the director from La Amistad Soccer Club. Now I participate on the New Portland Youth Soccer Program. Um, I'm a start a program in 2004. Um, this program is uh, focused on help and um, development kids with soccer. Uh, to prevent uh, youth crime, special on our low-income community, you know, and uh, I coaching ten years a team. I picked them when they was ten years old. Now they twenty years old. Ninety percent of those kids are in the college right now. So. Now I'm part of the work uh, community soccer program. And uh, in the last four years, uh, this is an amazing um, tournament because this gives the opportunity to our kids uh, participate on integrity on the, like a professional soccer tournament because uh, our low-income community, they don't have a opportunity to play on big clubs, you know, it's so expensive. So, and also, it's an opportunity to the kids, they not able for play in high schools because uh, low school grades. So, but, you know, everybody needs a second opportunity so this program is the best opportunity to them, you know. So please uh, continue to support this program because uh, it's very important for our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Mateo Morales, and I am from the Santos United Soccer Club. I'm here for the World Cup. I'm a big, I'm a big fan of soccer, and I, I live it and I breathe it every day. The Portland World Cup soccer is a big opportunity to meet people who are from different parts of the country and to share their passion of soccer in a competitive way and in a positive way. The World Cup soccer program gives the people who can't afford soccer registrations, such as like high school or other soccer areas, an opportunity to play in a tournament where it is like an opportunity for them to show their passion for it. This is a beautiful game with people who have the heart to play. I believe if we get this taken away, not only are you give, shutting people's dreams down, but you're taking their success away, their opportunity to show what they're capable of. And I believe if we keep this, I believe if we keep this Portland World Cup, I believe that a lot of people that, um, see this will have many stories to tell and also the fact that there's new people that are ready and willing to play at the age of 15 getting ready to start this world cup excited to meet the new people because of the stories we tell them i'd be it'd be a real big shame if you guys took this away and i believe you guys should keep this because this is a really great opportunity for people to show their love for soccer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. We're Thank going to invite you. the two of you to come up and I think we have time to pick three more random numbers. So check your numbers. I'm going to call them fast. If you have them, let us know and come down front. Number 106. 106. I do not see a hand for 106. Number 110. 110. Number 110. Raise your hand. I do not. Okay, number 110. Come on down, please. How about 113? 113. 113. 113. Yes? 113? No. Okay. <laughs> 108. Anyone for 108? We got 108. One, one zero. Okay. 108. 108. Yeah. <laughs> 108 was the one she called. We called 108. And before that, you called 113. She called it earlier. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you. Go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and uh, Commissioners. My name is Wesley Buholtz, and I'm the business manager of Laborers Local 483. Uh, Local 483 supports all of the comments made this evening and, last two, and at last Tuesday's Community Budget Forum in support of Buckman Pool, Parks for New Portlanders, the Selwood Community Center, and the Preschool Program. These are extremely valuable programs and the loss of any of them would be deeply felt by all Portlanders. I'm here to speak tonight on behalf of seasonal maintenance workers, a group of staff who every year return to keep our parks beautiful. They perform arduous work shoveling, digging, emptying heavy trash cans and hauling mulch, leaves and gravel to maintain our parks. Seasonal maintenance workers deal with needles, human waste and other hazardous refuse. They make parks safe for Portlanders. Seasonal maintenance workers are the, backbones of the, the backbone of the park's workforce. While it may be tempting to see a reduction in hours for the seasonal maintenance workers as a low impact way of realizing budget savings, I'm here to speak to the very real cost of this cut. Seasonal maintenance workers make between $13.20 and $14.48 an hour a wage below the $15.26 economists calculate a family of two with two parents and two kids need to live in the Portland metro area. For returning workers, being able to count on their seasonal hours is crucial. These workers depend on receiving the same hours year after year in order to pay for basics like food, rent, and transportation all year round. The reduction in hours will mean more workers seeking public assistance like food stamps and unemployment. For some, it makes a difference between an apartment and homelessness. I know that budget decisions are extremely difficult, but I ask that you re reconsider any delay in hiring se seasonal maintenance workers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. This is, I think I'm the first senior 
and I represent seniors all over Portland, but I'm in Selwood, and I have a story of what Selwood has done for me, Selwood Community Center. I have disabilities from a brain surgery, 96. I will read this so I won't repeat info. My Atlanta urologist gave me advice before I moved to Portland so my mobility, mobility would not decrease and maybe even improve. He said to stimulate my brain with active social life and exercise more. My son and wife put me in the Selwood apartment, had it waiting for me when I arrived in 07. The first grandchild was born three weeks later. They knew I would have the social interaction I needed with members of the exercise group at Selwood Community Center. Now I've lost my place, which I usually do. Uh, and that I would walk everywhere. They planned for me to have grands at the community center as soon as they were old enough, and I did. They are scheduled for lots of community center activities this summer. I would not have the mobility I have today if it weren't for Selwood Community Center. Six months after I arrived, I had improved physically and mentally because of my exercise group. Our class leader, Virginia Hancock, was really proud of what we accomplished in those first six months, something I hadn't accomplished in 10 years with curves. I must stay active to lo or lose my mobility. I must continue a Selwood Community exercise class for everybody. You're welcome to come, it's great. I can't imagine what I would do if I didn't have a Selwood Community Center for my needs and my grandchildren's needs. Selwood is the best location with the best facilities I have ever been a part of, better than Kentucky, Ohio, or Georgia. Selwood's Community Center and the library outshine any of other places I've ever lived. Thank you, Portland. <laughs> oh, do please give us your name. We didn't get your name, ma'am. Um, we didn't get your name, ma'am. What was your name? Oh, I'm sorry. I am used to be Jane Johnson. I'm Jane Hall. I went back to my children tonight. Hi, Steve. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lots of support around the room. We're going to invite our final um, speakers to come on up for their last round of testimony. I saw that, yeah. Commissioners, I'm Tom Lewis, the chair of Centennial Community Association, the second largest neighborhood in Portland. And I'm here to uh, speak to the strengths of the park system and also uh, the small grants uh, that are in question. The uh, avenue that we have used in Centennial is to uh, use the small grants to uh, use the park and bring advocates, fellow advocates, into the park on a particular night with the National Night Out and movies in the park. And that is probably one of the mainstays of our community activity because it's centric. Uh, being as large as we are as a neighborhood, it's difficult to gather folks from far and wide, but we try to hold that candle up. Um, we've uh, recognized that our deficit of park facilities in East Portland is uh, necessary to expand on, and we have that opportunity at Park Lane Park from five acres to add and develop the other 20 acres. We have uh, a master plan that includes a swim center, a couple soccer fields, and tennis, uh, skate parks. So it would really bring our community closer together and lend some equity of park space in East Portland. We will be taking uh, our show on the road to a 
school on the edges of Portland, out near Gresham, because that is our next neighborhood over. The neighbor, neighbors of Gresham are our Portland neighbors, and we want to partnership with them this year for uh, the movie and to expand notice into areas that don't have a chance to have their own movie. So I thank you for any support that way. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Good evening. Welcome. Um, good evening, Mayor Hales and Commissioners. My name is Jill Shepard Erickson. I'm Secretary of the Board of Directors of the Wilkes Community Group in the northeast border of the city. I'm a member of the Ethno Advisory Community, the uh, ONI Budget Advisory Committee, and past member of the East Portland Rovers and also an active member of the Youth and Elder Council of NEA, the Native American Youth and Family Center. Uh, I'm very grateful to the City of Portland for its support of community engagement to improve communication and quality of life in our, our neighborhoods. The Small Grants Program has allowed neighborhoods to identify projects to bring people together to solve problems. The intergroup volunteer efforts of the Rover Team for a National Night Out and Movie in the Park at Wilkes allowed us to provide safe family entertainment in walking distance to residents of the apartments along East Sandy Boulevard. I'm especially grateful for the diversity and civic leadership programs and their support for NEA and the inclusion of the voice of communities of color and cultural diversity in the work of the city. Of the ONI budget requests this year, I urge the approval of funding for the expansion of community engagement around housing emergency. We've been hearing about heartfelt efforts of com um, community members in the East Portland areas to engage the houseless residents in our communities and develop resources to meet the complex needs of all East Portlanders, from identifying camping sites, arranging for waste management and social services, to the search for affordable housing and potential shelter facilities. Thank you for listening and considering this request. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, um, members of the City Council and Mayor. Um, my name is Lindsay Betcher. I'm here to <laughs> I'm here today as a former ESL instructional assistant at David Douglas High School as a volunteer for the Portland World Cup and as a native East Portlander to give witness to the need for and the great power of the parks for New Portlanders program. I joined concerned citizen Nancy Folk who started the petition include parks for New Portlanders program in the 2016-2017 budget for Portland to restore this essential program to the 2016-2017 budget. The following are just a few of the comments from people who signed the petition. From King Amaro, as a person of color, I've personally witnessed the lack of representation and voice for fellow communities of color. Since the program startup, it's, I've seen relentless efforts from the youth ambassadors in working and serving the communities of color they represent. I've seen the relationships between the ambassadors and their respective communities grow together, providing the youth with support systems, events, and connections that would not have been provided without this program. From Deanna Woods, these programs are badly needed for the youth and families. It reflects what Portland as a community is about, practical and caring ways of building and sustaining community. From Cassie Cohen, this program is critical to saving Portland's reputation as a welcoming, inclusive city. And from Thomas No, New Portlanders Matter said it simply. As you can see from the gathered crowd here, Nancy and I are not alone. We are joined by hundreds of Portland citizens and community members and community leaders in the belief that engaging both newcomers and long-standing members of the community builds a bridge that fosters a broader understanding, reduces isolation, and helps keep many out of potential trouble. I know you've received hundreds of emails from school district board members coaches, teachers, students, and respected elders 
as well as phone calls. The time is now for the City Council to answer the youth, parents, individual Portlanders and organizations, the citizens of this city, and restore the parks for, Port for New Portlanders program as part of the 2016-2017 budget. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, before we close, we have a representative here from Representative Kathleen Taylor's office. I do want to give her a chance to speak on behalf of one of our elected officials. Thank you. Thanks for waiting, too. Sorry, one moment. That's okay. Good I was all ready to pack up and go. While you're getting ready, I'll say real quick, if any of you are willing, we do have some evaluation forms at the registration table where you signed in on your way out. If you're willing to give us your feedback on how this event went, how our facilitation was, we'd love to hear from you. Sorry, my notes turned out on my computer, so I will go ahead and pull it up on my phone. Um, I'll speak the part I know ahead of time. Hi, my name is Amanda Krause. I am staff to Representative Kathleen Taylor, who couldn't be here tonight and asked me to speak on her behalf. She is a representative for House District 41, which contains the city of Milwaukee and the community of Oak Grove, but also a significant portion of inner southeast Portland, which includes the neighborhoods of Selwood and Moreland. And she is here to speak on behalf of the saving of the Selwood Community Center. And let me pull up my notes now so I don't miss one of her important points. One moment. All right. Thank you for your patience. There we go. So she certainly has concerns about the cuts contained in the Parks and Recreation proposed budget and the effects those cuts would have on the community. Specifically, she opposes the proposed elimination of general fund support for the Selwood Community Center, which is a very popular and highly valued resource in the neighborhood. This center has an over 100 year history of building community and connecting neighbors and the doors should remain open. In addition to serving the community as a gathering space, a rental facility, and hosting classes, it services students through preschool and after school programs, as well as youth camps. The Selwood Moreland community has few affordable preschool programs and no other affordable after school programs, especially as the Boys and Girls, Girls Club is relocating to Rockwood. Representative Taylor additionally has concerns about the proposed closure of the Buckman Pool, which is located within the neighboring district of House District 42. These closures will have a significant and negative impact on the community and create a desert of gathering spaces in the densely populated Portland neighborhoods. Representative Taylor, of course, respects and appreciates the hard work you all are doing and is grateful you are taking the time to hear the community and give thoughtful consideration to their feedback throughout this budget writing process. Thank you again for your time and for these extra few minutes at the end of the night. I really appreciate your patience and thank you to all the community members and your great testimony throughout this evening. Thank you, thank you very much. Hello? Okay. For those who did not get a chance to speak, you can still submit your comments on the comment cards, I think, that they have in the back. Also, um, you can also email feedback to the city budget office at portlandoregon.gov. So the next forum is going to be May 12th at City Hall. And is there a final word from council? See if any members of the council have any comments. I just want to say once again, what a great public hearing. You know, we, we have just gotten such excellent testimony from citizens this year in the budget process. So we just really appreciate you all taking the time, crafting such good, thoughtful, passionate testimony. It makes our jobs harder and easier at the same time. So thank you very much. Yeah, ha jazz hands for you. Thank you much. All right. And I, I thank you from the I'd facilitators, like, too. I would just like to say thank you to Resolutions Northwest for their mediation and to Portland Community Media for uh, televising this. Here, here. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>